I'm yeah. Jennifer Gertz. I'm the project director for the Global Reading Network. And, um, and uh, many of you know who we are. Uh, we are uh, running the community of practice for the early grade reading community at USAID. And we develop a variety of publications and have events and toolkits, et cetera, to support um, implementation of quality reading programs. Um, we started supporting USAID last year through our team here on developing some guidance on comprehensive uh, primary grade literacy and numeracy programs to complement uh, the policy that has just come out, uh, which uh, focuses on USAID expanding into this area. Um, I know that uh, many of you here and online were at the Basic Education Coalition event on uh, March 12th with Julie Cram, where we had a nice discussion led by Rachel Christina from EDC. Um, on just some of some issues that the, that, um, the community should look after with respect to distribution of resources and thinking about sort of how to effectively build out programs really that are, that are already in place because we know that will probably be the approach for the most part. So um, we wanted to give an opportunity, and this will not be the only one, uh, for you to meet the authors of our, our um, uh, uh, Publication. There's some copies of here here on the table, but we'll also send out the link online for you to download it. And um, also, just to uh, they're they're going to present uh, various aspects of the publication. Look at sort of similarities and differences um, with respect to literacy and numeracy programming. Um, they're going to look at sort of program components, but also think about just subject areas and issues that um, our implementers may need to think about and discuss uh, distribution of resources and program components. And as well, they're going to, uh, Norma is going to lead a breakout on a potential research agenda. So for our colleagues online, although you're not here, I did want to give you a warning that about shortly before, I think, 3 o'clock, probably around quarter to 3, we're going to let you know if you would like to join Norma's small group on research agenda. She's going to go to another room. You can patch into a different link, and we'll give you those instructions after the main presentation of the, the pro, of the publication. So I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca Rhodes from USAID, but I'll ask the authors to introduce yourselves um, when you get started. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Rhodes, and I'm USAID's current team lead for reading and literacy. Um, and I'm just really glad that you could join us on this Friday afternoon. <laughs> Before CIES in yes. San Francisco, um, and very grateful for uh, your devotion of time. This is an important paper uh, for us at USAID. It's rightfully titled a working paper. It's not a literature review, and it's not a project report. It's a working paper that looks at a really big question for us, which is, yeah, we've published a policy that says, oh, all children should be literate and numerate. But we hadn't until this group of authors began to work on the question, really thought about what a guiding framework might be for achieving that with more efficiency than what we as AID have tried in the past, right? The aspiration of working on literacy and numeracy across the primary grades is not new for the Agency for International Development. Uh, this was something that, you know, continued to be held up in our publications of requests for proposals all through the 70s and 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And we kept saying, please make all these children in all these places literate and numerate. Uh, but in the end, I think experience has shown that we never invested enough per child to actually do that in most cases. And I'm very much including myself in that critique. I was a big part of doing that and not doing it well. So this publication is an attempt to only make new mistakes <laughs> and to learn from the mistakes of the past. Uh, and a big mistake, I think, of our past work in this area was that we didn't really examine with great clarity all the different pieces and parts that might need to be adjusted to provide comprehensive literacy and numeracy programming. So through the Global Reading Network, recognizing those past mistakes, we reached out uh, through Jennifer and her team to a number of specialists across your organizations uh, and across the world. Uh, and we were lucky enough, and I should really thank Dr. Deepa Shrinkantaya here, um, to have somebody who pulled together a lot of information and a lot of effort 
uh, to try to begin to, uh, to answer the question, if we needed a framework that was a better framework than old frameworks for comprehensive literacy and numeracy programming, what could we put forward? And begin to work within the field to see if this gets us any better results, any greater targeting of investment, any better balance of investment than some of those older programs that I was referencing previously. So I don't want to monopolize the airtime. Uh, I do want to say that this is important. This is not the last time you will see this framework from USAID. So you're very much invited to listen very closely to each of these authors and to learn everything that you can about it. Thank you, Rebecca and Jennifer. Um, <laughs> I'm Deepa Shrikantea. I'm a Senior Education Specialist at World Learning. Hi everybody, I'm Mary Sugru and I'm a Technical Advisor at Education Development Center. And I'm Norma Evans from Evans and Associates Consulting. Some of you have, may have seen this problem, so it's also testing your prior knowledge okay. and to make sure to see how many of you remember and how many of you may need a refresher. So, this is a problem that we, uh, we can give to second and third graders. So you have to tell me how 5 plus 5 plus 5 equals 550. And I'm going to give you one line like this. Okay, the line can be any length. It can be long. It can be short. It can also be in any direction. Okay, so think about it a little bit and see how this line can be put in either side of the equation, on this side or this side in order for 5 plus 5 plus 5 to equal 550. Does that make sense? So can I get a volunteer to come and show me what they did? <laughs> <laughs> the teacher. OK. <laughs> yep, very good. All right. so, so in that, there's always different solutions, different solution pathways. Is there, there's also another answer to this. Does anyone figure out the other answer? So this is one. The other one's a little tricky, but it goes on this side of the equation. Remember, you can change the length of the line, any direction. <laughs> so what I did was I put the line where there was a plus symbol, right? I put the line to make it a four, so it's 545 yes. plus five, which will equal 550, even though this is there right now. Okay, so that was the, that was a tricky one. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, we have a few authors who are not here today. Um, we just want to recognize that Amy is not here from Reading Within Reach, and Yasmin, I think, is joining us, but online from RTI. Um, we wanted to start by talking a little bit about the evolution of this paper, because it really was an evolution. It did not start life as a paper. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about the history and where it came from. And then we want to talk to give you a little bit, uh, a taste of some of the highlights from the paper, um, looking at this mosaic framework why the framework and, and what does it mean. Looking a little about what does the framework tell us or the different components of the framework tell us about what's uh, specific about teaching literacy and numeracy and also what are the commonalities between really good literacy instruction and good numeracy instruction. And then we're going to end by looking a little bit beyond the mosaic framework and there are, there are two sections of the paper that look a little bit beyond that look at some of the things to consider when you're distributing resources across literacy and numeracy or across the different components of the mosaic. And then looking a little bit at the research agenda which is focused on numeracy. Um, we will have three break, uh, two breakout groups after that. Uh, we will have one group that will stay here with Mary and uh, Deepa, and we'll look at some of the similarities as well as the differences between literacy and numeracy instruction. And then those of you who are interested in the research agenda will join me with the online folks in, in another room, and we'll look at some of the things that have been proposed as a, a starting research agenda, and what are our priorities around those, and what elements are missing. Um, we'll have a chance to report out, and then we're going to ask Rebecca to give us some of her deep and meaningful reflections about about uh, the discussion we had today and about moving forward. Um, okay, so we're going to start with sort of the evolution of this paper, and the two people in this room who were here from the very beginning are Mary and Deepa. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. So if I sit and talk, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so the. The idea for this paper actually started out with a conversation that I had with Rebecca when I was working at the Global Reading Network, and um, she wanted to she wanted me to um, kind of uh, start a conversation around how math and reading could be 
taught, you know, uh, there could be a more comprehensive approach rather to both math and reading instruction. And so we, we decided to do a webinar just to kind of explore and see, you know, how this topic could be addressed. And so that's how I invited Mary as well as Yasmin Sitopkot with our RTI who can today. And so Yasmin and Mary um, <laughs> did a webinar which I moderated. And then there was quite a bit of interest from the webinar. People were saying, oh, this is very interesting. We want to learn more. So we decided to do a paper, a working paper, about 10 to 12 pages uh, initially. And so, and, and we also did a longer, a day-long event around that paper. We presented that paper. And it was also very well received, but also many more questions as to how do we actually implement a comprehensive approach. And then so we brought on Norba, <laughs> who did magic <laughs> to the paper. Uh, so she talked about the mosaic and um, how that, you know, can be integrated into the comprehensive approach, and that's how this publication was developed. But I wanted to just um, add, Mary, okay. you wanted to wrap No, I, I don't think there's anything to add. Um, I, I think there'd be probably more questions after today's session, so we think this paper is going to keep going and growing and growing. And, growing. and so we'll see you again in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> With volume five. Yes. <laughs> um, so when, when I joined the conversation, it was at the same time that USAID was looking at sort of systemic and, and how do we make change beyond our pilots and how do we keep them going? Um, and as part of that conversation, was looking at some of the research and, and what do we know about actually making change that's meaningful at the classroom level. And uh, when I started looking at this, I was looking at a lot of the research that some of the publications that Louise Crouch and Joe Stefano were publishing around um, assessment frameworks, but also looking at the research around what type of large-scale interventions seem to have the most impact on student learning. Um, and so they <laughs> were looking at a synthesis of the research, and, and the conclusion was the ones that have the greatest impact are those that are very, very highly focused on what is happening in the classroom, more so than those that are looking at effective management or some of the other aspects of, of systems. And so it was, if you can focus all of your interventions on improving what happens at the classroom level, you have a greater possibility of seeing the learning gains that you want. Um, and so looking at their research at the same time that USAID was trying to, was looking systemically, what do we need to do, to do to really see the learning gains that we want? It sort of came together in this mosaic framework. So these sort of uh, elements of, of the literature as to what is important and what is not. We put this slide in at the last minute. That's why I'm surprised to see it here. Um, one of the questions that we get is, what's the difference between math and numeracy? And so if you, it's sort of mathematics is to numeracy what reading is to literacy. So. Literacy is sort of that high level skill that you need in order to interact, communicate effectively in all aspects of your life. And numeracy is the same thing. So it's that high level skill, whereas mathematics is sort of the stuff that you need. So think of reading as, as the skill that you need in order to be literate, and mathematics are the combination of skills that you need in order to be numerate. So we just put that one in there because I know there's been some questions about what's the difference between the two. And so getting, oh, I'm sorry, that's fuzzy, the mosaic framework. So it was based on, um, we need to make our, our interventions pedagogy and learning focused. And I think that's a really important one. So direct all your resources to aspects of educational systems that have a direct bearing on the quality of teaching and learning in your classroom. So if you look across uh, meta-analysis, those are the ones um, that have the most results. And so when we were looking at what are the components that the research tells us about, um, we came up with six. And I'm going to go through them very quickly. And you can add to this, but these are six essentials. The first one you need is the policies and standards that create an enabling environment for learning to improve. And that means that you need research-based learning progressions in your curriculum so that you're not spending three months counting to five, and one week learning double-digit addition. That you need uh, learning progressions that follow the development sequence, but also that are appropriately paced. And you need really, really clear benchmarks and standards so that we all know uh, what are the goalposts that we're trying to hit. And you need policies that really optimize learning. So that's everything from do they have sufficient time to learn in their program? Is that time being used effectively? 
Are they learning in a language that will enable learning? Um, and do we have assessment and accountability frameworks in place so that we are monitoring this learning across the system? The second one, and I know a lot of people in this room have been working on that, we need really high quality learning, uh, teaching and learning materials. And learning materials that are aligned with these learning progressions, but they're also aligned with uh, the research-based instructional models that we know will result in improved learning. Um, and for each of the disciplines. Number three, I know a lot of you have been working on this as well, we need really effective teachers and instructional leaders. Um, so for teachers, we need really effective in-service and pre-service. Um, in-service programs and pre-service that talk about the specificities. What is it that we know about teaching uh, reading? What do we know about teaching numeracy? What's, what are the evidence-based practices that we have across both disciplines that I can integrate into my teaching? Um, and we also need to build teachers' content knowledge uh, in literacy, in numeracy, but we also need to build, build what we call their pedagogical content knowledge. And that is, do I know how to teach place value? Do I understand place value the way that a six-year-old needs to understand place value? Can I explain it that way? And can I give them activities that will allow them to build the knowledge that six-year-olds need to build on that kind of stuff. Um, one of the, some of the research that we were looking at was looking at um, the best instructional materials in the world will not improve your learning outcomes if you don't have really good teacher training. So you need that balance between the effort that you're going to put to build really nice materials and the effort that you're going to put to train teachers around these. Uh, one of the ones that out until recently has sort of been left behind is that leadership component. And we have a lot of research that says next to what the, the decision that the teacher makes in the classroom, it's the decision that the head teacher makes at the school level that has the greatest impact on student learning. Uh, so looking at those effective school leaders, effective head teacher as instructional leader, district uh, leader as an instructional leader, and all the way up. And so, how can we train them on evidence-based leadership practices? Number four, it was interesting when we looked at that research, coaching alone doesn't give you learning gains. In-service alone doesn't give you learning gains. It's the combination of in-service training and follow-up coaching that gives you the maximum learning gains. Um, so we were looking at um, what we know about fidelity of implementation when we when we blend together training and monitoring and what we what do we know about the type of coaching activities that give us the biggest return on our investment um, and we have a, a really nice body of research that's starting to be developed and, and coming out of low-income countries that are telling us what makes a difference around that um, continuous assessment whether it's at the classroom level level formative assessment and remediation and we do know that teachers will practice formative assessment um, and then link that to remediation that their students score higher. And as well as do we have an accountability framework that monitors improvement in learning across the system and makes everybody responsible for students improving their learning. And then the last one was practice outside of school because we only have so many hours in the day. And when we can extend that day by having children engage in literacy and numeracy activities outside of the school day, we know that learning uh, results go up. Families involved, learning results for the public. So that if we can have these six components in our literacy and numeracy uh, programs, and if they are delivered in a cohesive and integrated way, um, with, that's when we will get the maximum learning gain. So I get to talk about the specificities, the hardest word in this presentation, <laughs> of evidence-based literacy and numeracy instruction, so the differences. So one thing is that literacy and numeracy content is very different. So we can agree on that and you know if teachers understand how the content is different then if they can also better deliver both the, or both the literacy and numeracy as well as um, understand how better to sequence and organize the lesson so just some examples of how literacy differs from numeracy is that literacy some of the literacy domains not limited to include vocabulary fluency comprehension in numeracy we're looking at number operations geometry and measurement and I'll get into some more of the details around this so when teachers know that literacy and numeracy have different content domains, they're able to better sequence and weave in into, the, in, into their instruction across the skill domains, instead of just focusing on one, such as vocabulary or comprehension in literacy or um, uh, number sense in uh, mathematics <coughs> or numeracy. 
And also teachers can select the appropriate materials and deliver the lessons accordingly to that. Um, so this is a very fuzzy chart, I apologize, but it's table one in the publication. And it um, highlights all the different uh, literacy domains and the definitions um, for literacy domains as well as the numeracy domains. So I think it's a, it's a good reference um, to kind of see the differences between the two. And another important thing is that literacy and numeracy domains are also structured very differently. Um, in literacy, domains are nested and they're also interdependent on one another. They can't be taught in isolation. Whereas in numeracy, they are not nested and they can be taught independently of one another. For example, children can develop spatial understanding or geometry or measurement skills without having um, developed knowledge of number operations, which is kind of interesting. So they can be, so the, the, the teaching of the two is very different. Here are some different ways that we would focus on um, to our focus literacy instruction, reading acquisition. So working, working on alphabetic awareness, for example, the relationships between sounds and letters, and then moving from, going all the way down to moving from fluency to comprehension. Whereas in numeracy, the approach would be a little bit different. Um, you can learn numbers, number operations, geometric relationships all together. So they're not necessarily uh, dependent on one another. And also another way, another difference between literacy and numeracy is that um, instruction is also sequenced according to whether it's a concrete, a pictorial, and abstract. And I'll go to that in the next slide. So in, uh, in neuroscience, we call this, it's roughly translated to the triple code, which is basically when a child understands that a number is represented as three, the number three, so T-H-R-E-E, -E, and also three concrete objects or um, manipulatives or counters and then also if someone is if a child is visually impaired it can also be three beats on their hand so it's the three ways that in order for us to um, master the understanding of the number the materials are also different between literacy and numeracy um, in literacy we have teacher read aloud texts decodable texts level texts um, in numeracy there's manipulatives diagrams drawing so they're also very distinct and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of the um, specificities under numeracy. Um, as I mentioned before, the domains are not nested. Right? They can be taught um, one at a time. Uh, and they involve um, different, they involve mathematical processing skills that I've included here. And they also make explicit connections between informal and formal mathematics. A lot of mathematics, mathematics is an innate understanding. A child, a two-year-old baby, for example, can manipulate numbers like three. So building on that way of understanding is very important. And also informal play and other household chores, whatnot, and, and connecting that informal knowledge to the classroom. And also using manipulatives and diagrams to represent numeracy concepts. So in the, in the paper itself, I know I kind of went through these slides quite quickly, but in the paper itself, you'll see the differences in how literacy instruction is delivered versus numeracy instruction. So I wanted to highlight some. And Mary will talk about, next slide, the similarities between the two. As part of, as the paper evolved, some of our discussion was, how does it work? What works in classrooms? Um, I appreciate what Rebecca has said about, did we invest enough in the past? And also what Norma has shared with us about um, effective teachers and leaders. And some of the, the research that we're, we're, we're coming across is that you have to invest in teachers and their skills, knowledge, and attitudes. Also, pre-service and in-service education um, is, in, it is important to improve student learning outcomes. So we decided to try and list some effective practices that would work in a literacy classroom and, an, and a numeracy classroom and encourage our implementers and colleagues to try and um, weave this into your programs. And some of this is very common sense, but we selected five. So this is the magic number. There's five right now. But we have um, highlighted in the paper that we feel um, there's evidence there that these work in a literacy and numeracy classroom. The first one is um, classroom talk. Not a focused, rich um, talk about literacy and numeracy in the classroom. And a teacher can do this by just asking children some open-ended, higher um, level thinking questions, like how did you read that word? Or how do you know that word was that word? What, how does it, what does it mean? 
encouraging learners to talk to each other in the class, to be able to say, how did you get the answer? Exactly what Deepa did this, this morning, giving somebody a problem, talk to each other about it, and then did anybody else have a different way of solving? And by training teachers on why this is important and giving them opportunities to implement this in their daily practice, this has been shown to be effective. Which is not surprising that the next one is using questions and encouraging teachers to um, change the emphasis from the right answer and the wrong answer, which we know is very common in mathematics classrooms, but instead asking um, um, learners similar, why, why did you get that answer? How did you approach it? Is there a different way for you to do this? Will make a big difference. Is, is, are there other solutions to this? Do you agree with what your colleague or your desk mate has actually said is the answer? Number three is providing children with daily independent practice and monitoring their work. And I think there, it's important to stress there is a difference between drilling and practice. And the idea of making sure that kids are not, or children are not involved in rote memorization, but actually these are meaningful activities that the teacher can pose, but it's still giving the learners an opportunity to practice what they know and include that discussion and talk about the process as well. We're not advocating that independent practice is long sheets or worksheets or long homework activities of repetitive answers. So again, higher level, thinking of practice for, for learners in the classroom. This one is using children's er errors to extend learning and correct misunderstandings. And I think we all have memories of, ma of math being, this is the right answer and there's a wrong answer. And now what we are um, encouraging in the paper is for teachers to actually um, discuss errors and misunderstandings in mathematics and in literacy as part of their daily practice in the classroom. Nora mentioned about pedagogical content knowledge and a good teacher understands misunderstandings happen in the classroom and that's how you adapt your teaching. You know that this is the, the sight word that causes a lot of ch challenge for the kids so you're going to give them an opportunity to practice. You're anticipating some of these issues. It's the same, you're going to have issues in a mathematics class, kids might misunderstand something. You're ready, you're changing your teaching styles or your approach to make sure that these errors are, um, they're anticipated, but also you can rectify them in the classroom. It's also an important part of learning for, for, for young children to understand about trial and error. We are always encouraging scientific thinking. Well, this is where this actually is fostered. Some of the best scientific discoveries have been because mistakes were made or somebody didn't get the right answer but learned something. And the final one that we have is using appropriate instructional practices to help children develop automaticity and our fluency in both disciplines. A lot of the um, research is showing that for if there is um, <laughs> There is a difference in the how you approach this for literacy and um, numeracy. So automaticity in literacy will be learning the, the letter names, the letter sounds, practicing, and, and to, to get to fluency. For mathematics, it's slightly different. It is about number sense. Developing what we find is that learners do, a teacher needs to use different strategies to help learners develop number sense. By number sense, that means that uh, you know an, um, how a number works. You know that number six could, is a combination of five plus one, four plus two, six plus zero, but you have that fluency and um, your fluent way of thinking about numbers, so it can actually help you work on the other um, bigger problems when you're working on a, a, num a number or word problem. What we um, stress here again is what I mentioned is there is a difference between rote memorization and thinking in our classrooms. These five approaches um, encourage teachers to have to develop those skills as opposed to rote memorization. Further detail is provided in the paper as well as all the references to the studies that um, explain why these are appropriate for the context that we're working. I mentioned briefly the, uh, the last elements of the paper. Um, 
There is a section on allocating resources because that's the big question. Uh, what if my program now has is, is going to expand its focus so it has not only literacy but has numeracy? How do I determine how to distribute resources across those two? Or if I look at those six components, and I know all six are important if I'm going to get the learning gains that I want, how do I determine where the level of resources that I should put in each of the, each of the components? So this section of the working paper has some suggestions for elements of a situational analysis and a data-driven situational analysis to allow you with the host country to determine um, which of the components needs the most attention and looking across literacy and numeracy, uh, how do you best distribute those resources to get the learning needs that, that you are aiming for? And finally, the very last section, um, we looked at sort of what are the key questions that we need to answer as we start building an evidence of, um, an evidence base for effective numeracy instruction in low-income countries. And we did focus it on numeracy, knowing that we have a, a, a really growing and important research, uh, research base for, for um, literacy. So when we looked at it, it sort of came to three important points. And the first one being, we don't have a lot of data coming from low-income countries about what are the elements of evidence-based numeracy programs in those countries, uh, the ones that seem to be delivering the results. We know that we have instructional practices in different types in, in high-resource countries, but the question is to what extent, extent will transposing those in low-income countries give us the, reason, the, the impact that we want, or do we need to rethink some of those and, and what they might look like? Um, the second one was looking at teachers' instructional practices and looking at sort of what are the instructional models that are appropriate for low, uh, low income countries um, and how do we embed problem solving in those instructional models and how do we have teachers using concrete or diagrams or symbols to re represent what are often very, very abstract mathematical uh, concepts. Um, so what are the type of instructional practices that they're using right now that are very effective? which may be very different from the instructional practices that we would see if we went to the neighboring school here. Um, and then how do we get them, what type of instructional practices could they implement, uh, given the conditions in which they're working, that would give us the results that we want. And the very last one is that whole important area of pedagogical content knowledge. Um, sort of what do we know about what the gaps are in teachers' uh, understanding of not junior high mathematics or secondary mathematics, because it's really, that's not terribly important. But where the gaps are conceptual understanding of foundational mathematical concepts that children need to learn, uh, how do we measure? How do we find out where those gaps are? And how do we best fill those gaps? All right. So we are off to look more deeply in one of those two subject areas. Um, and so we encouraged, as the, at the, as the presentation got started, we encouraged um, our colleagues online to put questions in the Q&A box. Mm -hmm. Andre is going to take anybody who wants to work on this, yes. this question of developing a potential research agenda um, with Norma to the, our Africa conference room. And we, I think we have shared a link online if folks want to come out of the webinar. Do they have to and so folks can go off with Norma if they'd like to talk about research agenda. And then here, Deepa and Amiri are going to allow a more in-depth discussion around the presentation they gave and what they presented in the publication. And uh, we'll take the uh, questions from our Q&A box if there are any there. So I'm going to look for those. So we can start with the audience here. And, um, and then I'll look for those online. Okay, so in-depth questions about what they present. I think it might, this is Rebecca from uh, USAID, I think it might be worth mentioning uh, because some people have never read through this yet. So I think this is a little bit broad to start with, guys. I think it might be worth mentioning that the paper is structured around those pieces of the mosaic and the differences and similarities are structured around the pieces of the mosaic. So there, the paper contains a lot of content about how your work in policies and standards might be similar or different, depending on whether you were addressing reading or math. How your work in materials might be similar or different, depending on how you address your work in reading or math. 
teacher training, what's similar, what's different, coaching, mentoring, similar, different, uh, assessments, similar, different, practice outside of school, similar or different. So I'm not sure exactly how you want to run your time, but maybe you'd like your people to think about a specific area and not just all instruction <laughs> and similarities or differences. Maybe there's a way to use this framework. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, thank you, Rebecca. I think that's a really good suggestion. I think one of the areas is, you know, we can talk about materials. I, you know, I know a lot of free programs say they also incorporate math, you know, into, you know, into their programs. And does it really address math or does it not, you know, does it address it to the extent that children are learning math or is it just introducing concepts around math that, you know, that they're introduced to, but then they have to further learn to formally mathematics. So maybe we can focus on um, uh, materials, high quality text and materials as in, mosaic, the, in the mosaic framework. I don't know if it's exactly in line with that, but um, the, with the focus on all children and different learning abilities and levels, um, uh, levels, and what that looks like when it comes to kind of the broad scope that a teacher encounters, so to speak, what are you finding and, and kind of pulling out in, in this document in regards to that. I know it touches on a couple of different pieces, so I'd be interested in kind of when you have such a diverse group of kids in one class, how are we um, kind of training teachers effectively and, and building that capabilities, or, or if that's kind of in, in here or not. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. And it is, the answer is in there. Um, yes, but it's not necessarily the the, no. the silver bullet. Yeah. Um, I think there is co a couple of clear messages in 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 this document about, as I mentioned, investing in teachers and teacher training. One clear piece um, says that you know, just by providing teaching resources, it doesn't necessarily mean that learning outcomes are going to improve. In the, sec the section that we described about the similarities and differences, there is um, it lists what a teacher needs to know to do um, proper instruction, and one of that one of those pieces is knowing your learners. So actually, being able to identify what stage of learning or development these learners are at. During the plan and the policy piece, we talk about the standards and what are reasonable learning outcomes that all children should be able to reach. And we encourage ministries to be able to identify those. At the classroom level, we expect that teachers can walk into a classroom, assess, do for formative assessment with their learners, and have an idea of how they can scaffold the instruction and also help the learners progress. So that's a key piece that we advocate for in in this paper. And for us, another key message for us as implementers is this is the standard we should have in our literacy and numeracy programs when we implement them in the context that we work in. Yes. Um, okay, so I don't I don't know if this is the kind of question that you're looking for, but I used to teach reading, right? And also taught special education, which included math for high school. And from my experiences, word problems in math is what makes it really meaningful for students, right? Instead of just that rote memorization. Um, and in teaching English as a second language learners, um, they really loved math until it came to the word problems, right? And so I'm wondering just, I haven't read the paper in, in its full, I don't know the paper, but, <laughs> but what, what do you do about word problems in your materials? And how do you solve the problem of like multiple languages, uh, mother tongue languages, which I'm sure Paul has a ton of opinions on, um, but when it comes to word problems, because knowing that that's what really makes it make sense to kids why we're doing this and how they're getting their answers. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a really good question. I, word problems is one of the areas where there is a very, you know, 
cross, there, there's a big cross, I'm looking at Mary, she's, she does more work on reading and I do more work on math, so we're sort of complementing each other. Um, so it does cross over like between reading comprehension and definitely math. Um, you know, one of the ways that, you know, I'll talk from the, from the math perspective, one of the ways that we've approached word problems is breaking down the word problems into a word, like a word problem map. So it's like, what are you given and where do you have to go? So you have this map of how you're going to solve the problem. And that really helps to break down the passage or the, the word problem that's presented to the students. And it's going to be different according to the grade level. So if you have like, you know, for example, in first grade, we wouldn't introduce too many variables you know, into a word problem, we'll say, okay, there's, there were, um, you know, three apples in the basket, we added two more, how many apples are in the basket now? So just kind of breaking those down. So it, it, I would say between grades one and three, students are also allowed to have manipulatives and counters. So they'll, they can, you know, solve out, okay, they can put aside three counters, for example, then add two to it, and then count down five. And generally, word problems are also recited to them orally. So I guess that's maybe where I have another question. So no, no, the point okay. is that sorry. Um, so when you recite the problems to them orally, they so in theory they should understand it, right? They should. Yeah. Um, so are you finding that 100% of students do understand it orally um, in the language that is written in, um, and it's just the problem of decoding it on the page? Are they face a roadblock, you know, or is it the actual language that is written in that they just don't, they wouldn't even understand that language even if it was read to them. Does that make sense? So like their mother tongue versus like English or French? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I feel like yeah. I know a lot of kids who progress to middle school or whatever in some low income countries who still can't necessarily, I, I wouldn't say that they're fluent in the language of instruction that they're given. I think um, what it boils boy, down to with the word problems as well is it's comprehension, basically. Yeah. Understanding what you're being asked to do and making meaning from it. Yeah. Um, in this paper, um, development partners actually provided case studies of how they approach specific ones. The reason I'm, going to, I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting this is the, the one from EDC is specifically about how to solve problems in the classroom, how to use or language to talk about solving what are the, po again, similar yeah. to what we say, rich talk first, because a lot of the problem solving strategies are, are cognitive, they're in the, in the head. Where there's a problem is with the decoding or the comprehension, we need to equip the teacher to know how to break that down in the classroom. Yeah. Showing them what, I mean, a lot of the, the teaching strategies are is looking at what, what, it, what are they looking for? What information do you have and what do you need? And I think they're proven strategies that would work even in a second language or multilingual um, setting. But again, that the teacher needs to be aware of the needs of the learner and also how to teach those strategies to to the learners. I just want to add to Mary that you know the, the concept of talking, like even talking about math at home formally is so important. As I mentioned, we're born with an innate understanding of mathematics. Because in order to formalize that, you know, children need to be spoken to. And I think that oral language and you know crossing over to math really will help of decoding or the comprehension of problems. So I, I understand like how at a high school level, because I've also worked in the United States, I understand like, you know, if a child is, you know, English is their second language, and then they come to a word problem because mathematics doesn't mean, you know, like maybe some of the other problems they're solving is, you know, it's, it's numerical as opposed to like, you know, reading, you know, reading a word problem and understanding. So I can understand how it's a difficulty there. Um, so again, it's that, you know, we'll, kind of the, the issue of like presenting the problem to them in English as opposed to like maybe Spanish, for example, yeah. So that, that language barrier is gonna be. And I think also, sorry, <laughs> the um, a key, uh, um, one thing we advocate as well is contextualization and connecting it to the learner's lives. So for designing the high quality text materials, that's really important that it's not the typical work problem, like two trains left Dublin Station at 2.40 and one was traveling at 80 miles an hour, what day do they get there? It's actually, they can connect it to something that's happening in their life. 
and in their environment, and that they can also be thinking about it outside of school once they've gone home, that they're going, oh, that's, I'm using my skill here. Problem, right? One thought I have about this is that when, when reading and comprehension and language become prerequisite for doing the math problem you can as long as you're going to stick kind of with the written mode here's the problem then that's fair difficulty but even across language barriers or language differences in verbal interaction you can negotiate meaning and you can backtrack and you can explain something in different words and there's all kinds of things you can do to bring up the comprehension level even if it's not the native language but they're their home language. So it seems like this verbal interaction part is really making a big difference so that the reading aspect doesn't become a hindrance to the math learning. Yes. And, and move through verbal interaction, make sure people actually understand what's going on, and then they can be using their kind of this conceptual knowledge to address the problem. The contextualization of that information or knowledge is so important. I, I, I was doing some work in Rhode Island, for example, and they had a lot of students, their, their state assessment is given in September, the beginning of the school year. Um, this was a couple of years ago, but they had a lot of students coming from Central America at the beginning of the school year taking the state assessment. And a lot of the questions uh, had the word snow in it. And kids were like, we don't know what snow is, <laughs> you know? So I mean, it's so important that, yeah, exactly, that contextualization and, you know, being yeah, familiar with your local environment and what's in your local environment. The other piece, I think that, um, be done with what Paula said, <laughs> is, um, and I did not mention this in my presentation, so I need to go back and edit it, <laughs> is um, encouraging learners to also ask questions in the classroom, mm -hmm. like asking when they don't understand something, and that the teacher, it's not always a culture of it's okay to ask the teacher questions, or why, why did you do it this way? I think that's something that we need to also look at as we train teachers and make them feel comfortable with that exchange of, oh, I don't know the idea either, or I don't know the answer, but let's find out together, which um, would work better, I think, in some of the context of the market. So, oh, no, I was just thinking, so that works great, like, in the classroom mm -hmm. time, right, when you have somebody to ask the questions right. and everything, but then that piece of what, how do you, empower students to be able to practice these skills on their own once they leave the classroom and they don't have anybody to ask the questions to maybe like nobody in their home knows the answers to these questions or speaks this language or whatever it is um does that mean that the homework type of questions need to be more automaticity fluency type like just the numbers you know or is it like i mean how do you send help in with these like more complex problems that get to higher levels. So, so like more for like yeah. school, like if the language, the language difference, that example, or for like younger children? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, sorry. It, just yeah. like how do, you, how do you give a kid homework yeah. if they can't necessarily read, like it's fine if they are fluent readers and you can send them home with instructions yeah. and explanation of how to do the pro problems. They can go back and look things up and reread like how to do it in the explanation and then go and do the problem, right? But if they can't read the instructions and the examples and stuff and reteach themselves out of class and they don't have anything to ask, like how do you solve that problem? I think no sorry, sorry. No, I think it's I, I, it's, no, no, I mean yeah. I can totally identify no, to what you're talking yeah. about because I you know I, I can understand how when English is a second language and you're you're trying to do address word problems at high school, for example, like middle school and high school, and the child has to do homework in order to practice, you know, what they've done in math class. So, you know, in, in this in that case it would be a little bit different from when you're working at the primary school level, like maybe grades one, two, and three. So that's why I was asking you the difference, but okay. I think I think maybe the example that you're that you're that you've, um, kind of taught you that you've addressed is probably more like high school level, in which case I would I would uh, you know what Paul has mentioned is correct is like you know giving them familiar words you know in the word problem and then giving uh, providing word problems that are similar to the word problems that are given in class so they almost have a legend in terms of how to solve problems at home yeah. they get into the the um, you know, sort of the idea of like, okay, this is what I find, and this is my process, and this is what I mean. I'm sorry, this is what I'm given, this is my process, and this is what I find. Kind of getting into that, mapping out the word problems. Right? 
I think um, as well, I agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> I don't like presenting, but I love answering questions. So, um, I think what you're raising is actually very common in where we, where the language of instruction is different to the language at home. And if you even look at this at the mosaic model, it's the same thing, regular practice outside of school. It might be playing game. It might be playing games in the community. It could be a community engagement approach. It could be a parent awareness campaign saying your child's starting this at school. This is how you practice it at home. Or, or just telling the parents to talk more to the kids, right? Like yeah. encouraging the parents to say, what did you learn at school today? So you reinforce it and like you get that. Yeah, method. So they know you have homework. I did this kind of problem at school, so I got to do the good engagement and somehow in the domain outside of school. And I think this is a continual challenge in all education systems between having a canned approach to education, whereas you go home in the evening and you open page five and you do your homework and exercise, to the quality of teaching that we actually need, which is where the teacher can give them knows the learners well enough, has assessed what they did at the end of the day, and is able to say, this evening I need you to do this piece of practice. Right. There is a whole debate about homework, which I don't want to get into. <laughs> and, and it's also like the setting of the homework too, because like in, yeah. in the US you have after school where you can sit with your peers and work on homework and like dialogue and talk about it versus the kid who goes home who sits by themselves on the counter and may or may not understand what they're struggling with or have right. a parent who can help them, right? So, I mean, yeah. the setting and what yeah. structures you have will influence that and in, and another, package. Yeah. In another, um, do you know, how <laughs> we've worked is we see some learners are very capable of working on complex problems because it's part of their daily routine anyway. Yeah. They are have responsibilities at home, they may be taking care of somebody else, um, a younger child, an older sister, they have chores to do, they are, know how long it takes them to go and do those activities in the evening. So there are certain skills that might be reinforced, like the, the, the teacher and the, the, the teacher can um, get them to do and then just describe, describe how they did it the next day at school. So removing that obstacle which could be the, the the reading piece of that homework. But what, what you said earlier in the presentation time about the importance of teachers having the ability to figure out what their students are like. Yeah. So what you do isn't necessarily for, for it, 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 a matter of the original design and materials. It may, what kind of figure out who you've got, do I have to make some accommodation? And the materials may not have that accommodation in the yeah. teacher. We're trying to get teachers willing to say, okay, I've got a bunch of kids who don't, may not get this problem, so we're gonna, and they do something. They go through the word problems before they leave class. So I don't know what, but assuming that that's part of this whole package, yeah. is the teacher is able to assess the students and spot where the difficult areas are and make appropriate adjustments. The multiple means of engagement, I mean, if that if happening, or having that in the classroom, it's, it's, you know, if the teacher has a, you know, that training, we talked a lot about like pedagogical content training, so if, you know, service education, if the teacher is exposed to how to engage the students in different ways, and then gets that understanding, you know, I mean, it's also part of the differentiated instruction, you know, so that, you know, you're, you have a student who may have like a language barrier, for example, so what's the best way to work with that student in order for them to overcome word problems, or even following instructions in math, you know, I mean, I know that, you know, Math can seem like oh, it's a bunch of numbers, but you know, following instructions in order to make sure that you get the logic as well, you know, what you're solving for. So I didn't know. I wanted to point out for anybody listening online. I see Paul that you've got your page open to it, but I thought the reference is really useful. Right, page 24 of the document really tries to set up a framework to think about all these hard things we're asking teachers to do, both in the discipline of literacy and the discipline of numeracy, right? And so at the top of page 24, we have this framework that is critical to this working paper uh, that talks about the content knowledge area that a teacher needs to be able to manage and master, the pedagogical knowledge area, and the technological knowledge area. And so, just a second, Stephanie. So I just, for people online, 
the things that Deepa and Mary are describing are in the interstices across and between these, right? So obviously, there's a great deal of content knowledge of literacy and of numeracy that a good primary school teacher working in a comprehensive way would have to have. But that's only less than a third of what we need for a teacher, because then we need a whole bunch of stuff that Mary and Deepa have been describing that is more in that green circle of pedagogical knowledge. So the how am I going to teach this wonderful content that presumably I fully understand. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> there's the sort of thing that Paul spends a good amount of his life on, the what am I using to do that? which in this framework is titled technological knowledge, but you could think of as the materials and stuff that I have on hand and you know the things I want in my room. Um, and so I just, this page 24 is really the grounding conceptual idea behind the things that Mary and Deepa have been bringing up. And what the rest of that chapter three of the paper tries to do is go into each of those circles in the diagram and talk about what's specific in literacy and numeracy in content knowledge, in pedagogical knowledge, in technological knowledge, and then what's the same. And what would that then mean from a programmatic perspective? Because it's one thing to talk from a, pers from a perspective of how will I teach this? But when we're thinking at the donor level about funding a program or financing a program or implementing a program, we have to think about not only what do I want to see teachers doing, but also what things do I have to have on hand and in place to get them there. So we have two levels of thinking we've got to deal with. Building on everything you just said <laughs> is my question of how do we know what they know? And then how do we design to support Which the teachers? Okay. The teachers. Yeah. So we, we talk a lot about knowing the students. But a lot of it is also knowing the teachers and supporting them to know what they need to know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to pass it back to you guys. Yeah, I am. <laughs> no, and I agree with everybody. It's very diplomatic here today. But I <laughs> you can <laughs> totally it's refreshing. <laughs> Normally, when um, you work with a group of educators, it's usually like varying opinions. Yeah. So it's very nice. Um, we also have to remember everything that's mentioned here and then the attitude and beliefs yeah. of the teacher yeah. Yeah. and that's usually where we actually start with um, is in talking to teachers and actually trying to figure out what they do know and what they don't know and um, you will there are tools there there's examples of how you can do that um, in this paper or it was in at one point in the paper <laughs> I'd have to find the page number but it, it stresses the importance of understanding where the teachers are, are coming from and working with them as well to change some of those attitudes and beliefs. That also applies to the plans and policies that we talk about and um, the um, how a curriculum, a country's curriculum for mathematics and literacy is designed and established. You might actually have to start your conversation, your dialogue could actually start there. Yeah. Why are you teaching this in an early grade? Is it developmentally appropriate? Is this the necessary skill? Do you want to go faster, deeper? Where do you need to go? And often, if you're not just looking at the teacher, you're looking at the whole big picture of how teachers are trained, what are they using, what, does the, what are the plans and policies, how is it assessed? Because often, assessment also is the one that drives the instruction. Well, the, the, you, you've got coaching and mentoring in here someplace, aren't you? Yeah, it is yeah it's, actually it's, in there. it's tile number four number of this four. framework. So, I wish to again say, some donors think this framework is really important to consider. Part of the answer of how do we know what they know is, you, you know, may, everything may look right, but you get them in the classroom and you find out uh, this did not sink in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that's a, an important element of the coaching and mentoring because if you've got good coaches and mentors, then they're, they're the ones that kind of look like what they're supposed to be doing, what they're actually doing. Is it a belief thing? Is it a content knowledge? You know, what are the pieces? And then try to kind of go over that ground again that in some ways 
you always have to wait until they're, they're doing it before you really know whether they got it or not. And I do want to come back to Stephanie's question of how do we know what the teachers know? And it's a like it gets really hot. Like yeah. people get really defensive and like their jobs are on the line kind of thing and everywhere, right? So like, it's always, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to make a plug for a couple of things here. <laughs> the Global Reading Network has classroom observation toolkits yeah. coming out to a Global Reading Network soon near you. <laughs> so one way to know is to use tools that we all as a community have agreed are useful in seeing what is going on inside a classroom. Um, but I do think it quickly bridges, as Mary was saying, back to the policies and standards area because there's a lot, and you'll see that reflected here uh, in chapter one on the policies and standards, um, there's a lot about in-service and pre-service that's at that sort of more policy level of what's the curriculum for training the teachers of the country where we are. Yeah. And, and actually the kinds of aspirations that we all have behind good literacy and numeracy development cannot be addressed without getting involved at the curricular level for teachers, yeah. Yeah. not just the yeah. curricular the level training for children. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, about that too, having gone through classroom observations as a teacher and feeling very like insecure at times about having somebody else come in and evaluate my performance in the classroom, right, and then having to respond to that. Um, I'm thinking about this other overarching piece of positive school climates yep. and how you create that and foster an environment where teachers or school leaders feel receptive to feedback mm -hmm. and, and are willing to take risks, especially when teaching something like numeracy, where, you know, literacy teachers and numeracy, I mean, they might not be comfortable, you know, switching to literacy and numeracy. And so how does that factor into this positive school climate? How do you put into print what's kind of intangible or that is the linchpin to making it work right? yeah. it, it, not all uh, not all systems uh, are uh, designed around positive school climate presumably it is much more being evaluated and by you know someone the supervisor comes or the inspector comes right. it's not about learning and growth it's about about it and yeah am i going to keep my job or not yeah so that's way back even before your peers, your, like peer-to-peer -peer observation yeah. you really and I, I think you're raising a good point about um, you have to have quality at all levels. If you have a cascade system or a coaching system where you need good coaches who can model and know how to scaffold an experience for a teacher, so they, they feel it's a positive experience, that they're on a professional development continuum. And I think it starts, as Rebecca says, in, in pre-service, I would like all teachers to leave pre-service thinking I'm on a journey for the next number of 20, 30 years. I will learn how to be a better teacher for the next 20, 30 years. And I will continue to learn until I retire. I think that's a very important piece that all pre-service teachers need to have. Governments and um, professional development policies should also factor some of this in. I think partly from when a newly qualified teacher enters the classroom, they have a different set of needs that they need to maybe bring some new ideas into a school where they may also face opposition going, we've been teaching it this way for the last 20 years. And having a good coach, a good leader, as Norma mentioned, who is skilled and able to navigate that school environment, that's invaluable as well. So I think it's looking at each level and saying, right, well, how can we get quality at each, at each, at each team. also create like professionalism. I think that's one of the things that we also face when we work in different countries is that, you know, being a teacher is it's sometimes not seen as a professional. And, you know, I know that I, um, I, when I was working in India, like a lot of research around like, you know, creating professional communities of teachers, you know, this is a profession, you have a community, you have coaches, and, you know, others that can help you to professionally grow. Um, I wanted to add something else to what you were saying. Oh, and also, like you mentioned, you know, if a teacher feels comfortable um, teaching reading versus math or numeracy, and, you know, at the preschool level, the 
teachers teach both oftentimes, right? And um, what we notice is that there's a, there is a fear or kind of um, more, more hesitancy in teaching numeracy or math. And uh, some of the pre-service programs that I've been involved in and also in service for math, a lot of the elementary school teachers will say, oh, I can't do math. And, yeah, I think you can do it, you know. So it's like a lot of that is also translated so that the fear and anxiety should also be addressed in a lot of the teacher programs. And I would like to point out that on page 35 of the document, <laughs> there's a whole bit on it. You've read it more than once, years. haven't you? <laughs> just and yes, so just to, just to give people a sort of handhold to some of the answers to the question that you're asking, um, there's so, so you're right that the kind of positive school climate is an even bigger animal than what is addressed in these six yeah. tiles. But where there's a point of connection for this working paper is under tile number three, with this discussion of what effective leadership would be at the school level for promoting improved literacy and numeracy instruction. So there are some connection points to your question in the work that, that these authors have prepared. I thought page 22 is the attitudes. Yeah. So, I did find your um, reference. I, would have been I think to kind of go through the outline of the paper. Everyone is there, so, yeah. so that we can, you know, because there's sure. some really great case studies as well in the paper that highlight some of the questions that you're um, discussing as well. Yeah. It just makes me think about, and this could be a newer discussion when we get into, we should probably combine the coaching and the classroom observation tool discussion together, mm -hmm. but it would be worthwhile to revisit in that discussion how to leverage your resources when you're doing coaching observation of specific types of practices mm -hmm. to look at both literacy and numeracy classrooms and also organizing for a review of what you've learned. There might be some interesting ways or there might be some considerable overlap, right, mm -hmm. at the issues that you look at. Um, with coaching and the classroom observation to kind of revisit in those later discussions. And I'm not sure if there was much in here on that, but it might be worthwhile to bring that up. And there are definitely some, some foundational ideas here, but it, there's much more to explore. I can see that Stephanie has an online question. Uh, yeah, so before, before we go into a, a different discussion about the structure of the paper, I just wanted to share um, from Emil Hafiz that the, uh, they say re-teacher ability, I'll add that my organization focuses on a balance here of L&E metrics, teacher observation, coaching logs of qualitative information, frequent teacher visits and support with an awareness of the trust that requires. We don't assess teacher knowledge for fear of discourag discouraging rapport, a crucial element, I feel. Yeah, and that's definitely been borne out by the work we've tried to do as a, as a donor agency in the literacy space and would be very true of any further efforts in numeracy. You know, it's great for USA to write a policy saying, oh, let's teach literacy and numeracy to everybody all the time altogether. But in the end, the people who will bear a lot of added burden around that new decision by a donor are the teachers. So being sensitive to that reality, I think is really important. Um, it may not have been the final version, but at one point when we were preparing one of the webinars, we talked about um, mastery as well. The teachers need approximately 20 opportunities to practice something that they, they discover or they've learned in a face-to-face -face training. And it's a bit like, you know, making teachers feel confident that, oh, I have to practice at it before I actually can really get good at it. Mm -hmm. I think some of that is also, as you said, establishing that inspection or classroom observation is not about whether you're doing it right, you're excellent, or you know, that you were saying oh, this teacher is practicing this activity until they're going to get better. I like Deepa's idea of just quickly touching on the table of contents of the paper, right? Because to nobody's surprise, <laughs> it relates to this framework. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are those first pieces that Norma had discussed in Chapter A. It's really sort of about what are we looking at in terms of moving into formal skill instruction. But the big chunk of the paper is Chapter B, and it very much follows these tiles in this quote-unquote mosaic framework. And again, it very much tries to break down where do you have similarities and kind of things we can already capitalize on what we've learned in the literacy space, and where do you have very different aspects for numeracy that you're going to need to take into account 
uh, in your in your programming across a wide range of schools and children. So it so chapter B really does go through policies and standards, similarities, differences, texts, similarities, differences, teachers and school leaders, similarities, differences, teaching and coaching and mentoring, similarities, differences, assessment, similarities, differences, and practice outside of school, similarities and differences. And then it's the rest of the paper, the back end for chapter C and D, that's about the um, resource considerations, right? How will you know what to buy and what to pay for if you're planning an intervention? And then the beginning of the learning agenda. So I don't know, Mary and Deepa, if you want to say any more about the paper structure, but I think it's a good idea to just reference people to the table of contents as yeah. we're trying to put out there these organizing principles for thought. Yeah. I think um, just to highlight the case studies are there. So it's trying to, um, even though we know the research agenda is going, we have selected. Um, case studies from various organizations as examples of best practice. So if you're looking for how does it walk and talk, that's in the case studies. And also bearing in mind that um, it, this is the Global Reading Network and we're in all different contexts and different languages. There's text boxes included which give specific examples or additional information for people to um, learn something um, new. Um, are just to reinforce a concept. I'm going to ask a question that's a slight change of subject. Um, so this is just about regular sort of practice outside of school. So there's this sort of belief that, um, and that I've heard frequently, that unlike literacy, there's, a, there's association between literacy practices outside of school and strength of training. That there's sort of a belief that numeracy comes easier folks in environments because they're in the market, because they're doing this, because they're doing that. So I'm sort of looking at the quite I was looking at the section on materials you use inside of school to support literacy and numeracy, but also the literacy homeschool activities and activities and numeracy homeschool activities. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about engaging parents to support literacy and numeracy and some sort of Myths we might need to get out of our head as we begin, begin to practice this. Can we assume that they have materials at home to support numeracy just based on the types of things that's on the list? Should we assume that, you know, how do we how do we engage them around home sets of activities and, and maybe some of the myths that we might be I think um, it, we touched on it um, earlier. It's about um, creating awareness of how to develop literacy and numeracy skills outside of, uh, outside of school. And I think it's trying to be smart and exploit whatever you can, what's available, um, because I think that's the most sustainable approach. So if it's, a, if it's a case of working with parents or community members to say, okay, these are good ways you can talk to your child about mathematics, or these are good activities, then use what you have available to, to do that. So I think that's why we need the example of the market comes up because that is something that parents can do with their children because it's a daily activity. And um, I think that's why it's brought, it's used and maybe it's overused. But I think generally, um, once you create an awareness about how you can develop skills, parents do, do start employing those with weaker kids. Yeah, I would just to add that, um, just add to Mary that we, in reading with us all about the moral language, you know, sort of like talking to your child a lot. Similarly, mathematics, you know, as I mentioned, a two day old infant can manipulate numbers up to three. That doesn't mean that, you know, everyone's going to become like, you know, a mathematician if it's not formalized or if it's the child is not talked to. Definitely a lot of household chores, you know, like setting tables, at a, or sorry, setting plates at a table, for example, you know, all of that needs to be formalized. So even though we do have an innate understanding of mathematics, it needs to be developed and formalized. So I, I wouldn't say that one is easier than the other. I think that maybe some, like mathematics maybe is a bit more intuitive sometimes, but it definitely needs to be formalized. Parents do need to talk to their children. And there's a, quite a bit of research around, you know, when children do go to the marketplace, you know, that exchange of money. I mean, there is practice there, but then what, what type of money are they exchanging? Usually it's 
Sometimes it's whole numbers. Yeah, exactly, whole numbers. And you know, it's um, maybe smaller change, right? So you're not doing complicated fractions, decimals, percentages, which you need to know by grade four, for example. So all of that needs to be formalized and you know, some of the activities that can be done at home, you know, as long as, as the parents talk to them, you know, like cutting, uh, you know, for example, a piece of bread in half, you know, or cutting it in one fourth and understanding the difference between a fourth and the rest of the, the loaf of bread. So, yeah, I think that it just, it, the more that we talk to children from a very young age, I think that, you know, both numeracy and literacy and then also the intersections between the two, you know, like where they do, like that's where the word problems we were talking about before, they become better at comprehending what means. No, I, I, I do think that we have to be really careful if we think that they're bringing a lot of, they're bringing more of mathematics into the primary class than they're bringing literacy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, we, I think we, we have to be really careful. Yes, they've looked at objects, they've turned them around, you know, they've, they've separated things, they've put things together. Um, but as, as Deepa was saying, they've never formalized what they're doing. And, and until you realize, you recognize, oh, that's what I'm doing, and then I can apply it to this situation, that unless there's a link made to those informal notions that you're bringing to the classroom, it isn't going to get a child very far. The same way that they should be bringing a lot of oral language into the early literacy class that we're using to build on. But the oral literacy that they may be bringing in may be very limited because they've, they've had the same types of conversations or they've used limited, they've, they've had limited interaction with broad vocabulary or with, with uh, complex sentence structures and things like that. So I'm, I'm not so sure that there's more in the environment to support the development of numeracy understandings. And just to add another thing to know, sorry, and then we'll get to your question, sorry. Um, and I'll be giving a presentation at CIS uh, on something similar, but looking at universal design for learning in math. But one of the things that I wanted, to, that I'm gonna highlight is that just that marketplace exchange or more of the informal mathematics, what we see is that, you know, children have to develop a mental number line. And if it's, if mathematics is not formalized, children actually have difficulty um, with numbers past, I think, like 35, 34, 35. So if a child has not formalized their mathematics, they can't tell you the difference between 37 and 39, for example, which one is bigger, rather. And that's the small they can give numbers. you the correct change. Yeah, they'll give you the correct change, but they wouldn't be able to yeah, exactly formalize it. And that's those are small numbers. Right? And it's not even getting into fractions or decimals or percentages. These are whole numbers. And I think it becomes a number line is even smaller with words. Sorry, because um, you know, obviously it's linked to reading. So I think it's like the mental number line. I think stops at ten because perhaps like on a dollar bill, you, I mean, not a dollar bill, but a ten dollar bill, you see ten right now. So the research shows that it's actually smaller the number line for words than numbers. So it's if it's not formalized and that marketplace interaction is very limited. Sure. <laughs> um, to so what you're saying about the importance of starting at a really young age, and also to our conversation before about the opportunity to leverage parents as additional instructors for out of school time. Um, I'm thinking about early childhood education. And I'm wondering if there's a difference in approach to early childhood pre literacy and pre numeracy instruction, or if there's a common approach, and if that's talked about in the paper. Or not, if that's not so. Yeah. So, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, yeah, we do talk in. Um, oh, wait, did I the but, yeah, so we do talk about in the early years in, in chapter eight. So, there is a little bit of uh, early childhood in there, but um, not a lot. Yeah, that could be another paper. <laughs> but there are some, I think there's a case study example, right? Now, as well. Yeah, there are some from, yeah. from some preschools. Okay. I think it's in there for, for, yeah. for preschool. Yes. But the yeah. paper is, um, I mean, I think there are, I would think you would at least have to ask yourself some questions about these different categories. If you were thinking about a, a sort of structured program for children at the pre-primary level. Um, and certainly USAID's current commitments do not encompass every last bit of early childhood development, right? <laughs> We've sort of got some boundaries um, around what, the, what we would as a donor uh, be looking at. So I think this might be a decent starting point for some exploration. But beyond that, 
content in chapter A, this paper didn't address pre-primary. And, and somewhere where it, I, it, our work does um, kind of intersect is at the, the curriculum development. When you usually work with the government, and they are, a lot of the context we are working in currently, they're developing pre-primary programs on paper, and that's a good opportunity to have a discussion about maybe shifting things up or down or um, about skills and, and various approaches, and that can happen at that level, and that's also an effective way of getting our, our partners to think about pre-primary, even if we're not supporting it directly. So thinking of the out-of-school stuff and what parents can do, and that would be preschool as well, <clears throat> do you all treat in here kind of the, the math uh, parallel to, you know, how does a, a parent who can't read help their child outside of school. So how does a, when you got teachers coming in and say, well, I can teach math, you know, so they've got this preconceived, they don't, I don't, they don't have a framework for math. So there it seems like, you know, so how do you help parents who don't do math, as it were, to help their kids with math outside of school or before they get to school? That's a good question. I, I think, you know, in terms of the, the talking part, you know, counting, Know, most parents will be able to count with their children. Mm -hmm. So counting the number of shoes in the house, for example, or the number of, uh, you know, siblings or your cousins, etc. So I think that counting can definitely be spoken to with the children. Um, but when it comes with, you know, maybe some more complicated uh, topics like fractions and decimals, where we see even teachers, you know, having difficulty with and it, you know, there could be some limits. Yeah, there's some limits, limits exactly. But I think that you know the, the first the talking part, you know, just like the oral language, can definitely support the mathematics development. And on one of the previous webinars, a similar question was raised, and it was also raised about well, what do you do when math gets difficult? And when parents, it's easy for grades one, two, and three, but then algebra comes along, and <coughs> and then I can't do math. And also some of the work you have. We have to consider with community engagement is also working with parents to have a positive attitude and have a goal attitude with math mathematics as well that it's a case of oh I can't help you with this homework ask your father or ask your brother or ask your sister because they have a head for numbers you know these um, beliefs also often can come from from the from our families about math is difficult or that person is really good with numbers. <laughs> and it's also trying to work with communities about giving a positive um, outlook to, to, to math as well. So on page 45 <laughs> of this document, uh, we find table four, a very useful set of things that can happen at home. Uh, and again, table four follows this whole sort of concept that tracks throughout the paper of sort of putting these things next to each other, right? What does this look like in literacy? And then what does this look like in numeracy? So yes, right, perhaps not every parent could do everything listed on the numeracy column of table four, but this is certainly a sampling of ideas that could happen so that practice outside of school might be achievable in the numeracy space. Sure. And I think I, I wanted to just highlight, thank you Rebecca for highlighting the table, <laughs> but the math games is, you know, there's so many indigenous games or local games that involve math. And when I was doing some work in Sri Lanka, um, there was a, a math educator that actually took all of the indigenous games that had the math component in it that was not formalized. He formalized it and introduced it into the curriculum as formal math games that could be, you know, taught with division, with trigonometry, you know, and uh, with, you know, geometry. So I think that that's that's also like, you know, just informally doing that at home, and then, you know, being able to connect is also really great. Too. One thing that worked for us in the school where I was teaching, because the parents were super intimidated to try to help their kids with high school level math here in the U.S. too. Um, we found a lot of success with peer tutors and peer tutoring programs uh, for math, particularly. Even more than English. I want to plug one part of the paper we haven't talked about yet, but it's my favorite. Wow. <laughs> Which one? Um, so on page 54, pick a favorite. 
bibliography. <laughs> you will find a bibliography. <laughs> so, first of all, I think it's worth recognizing what these authors went through to distill down. You might think that a 50 page paper is a long thing, but if you look at the bibliography, you realize it's actually a short thing based on all the things in the bibliography. Um, but also, I just want to say that this is, you know, a tangible demonstration that what is suggested here is not simply the brainchild of a passing bureaucrat. <laughs> it's actually got some roots in evidence. And I think that we are really going to have to be careful going forward if we want to make only new mistakes, that we keep this idea of doing comprehensive literacy and numeracy programming evidence-based and rooted in the evidence. Um, and so this is really, you know, to your credit, proof that the paper you have here is well-founded. And if people are doubting or want to know more, they could read all the articles and books that are listed in your bibliography. Also an option. <laughs> so we have about uh, 20 minutes left, and I wanted to see if we could take, um, I know six people joined Norma's session, mm -hmm. um, but there were many more folks here. So I thought maybe if one of you could take about five minutes to talk a bit about what um, we discussed in our session in terms of what are some of the deep questions that we discussed, but maybe where where you can really focus on is, you know, just summarizing some of the deep questions you can discuss and where they can find information in the book. <laughs> in the, in the, yeah. oh, sorry, not in the book, in the paper. Okay, it's okay, we call it a book as well. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, oh. <laughs> right. And I think and if I recall, we talked <laughs> <So, laughs> we talk quite a bit about language and instruction. We talked a little bit about I think, comprehension. We talked about um, um, teacher's knowledge, and we talked a bit about coaching, uh, and a bit about out-of-school support. So maybe you can share some of the things we discussed and <laughs> where folks can find more information in the book, in the working paper. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll talk about some and very much sure. work. So uh, just the last point that we were talking about, we, we um, Actually, well, before that, we were actually talking about comprehension and how comprehension is uh, when you're reading a word problem, for example, that involves comprehension. So it's a really clear um, kind of intersect between reading and numeracy and various strategies around how we approach that. But when we sort of talk about comprehension, we realize that a lot of it kind of comes back to the language and the oral language of the talk that happens at home and how students are starting to formalize these concepts of numeracy as well as talking and you know building their vocabulary at home and how that leads to comprehension so uh, we spent we spent quite a bit of time talking about you know uh, how to you know formalize mathematics I think maybe some of you are part of the discussion but um, maybe online not you know how to um, ensure that we talk you know student parents talk enough to their uh, to their children and there's enough talk within the community about um, numbers about concepts around math, you know, even if it's as simple as a half, you know, you're splitting a, a meal in half, for example, introducing that word half into the students' vocabulary is very important and will help them with problem solving later on. Um, and Rebecca highlighted a nice chart, which I was looking at before when we were talking about it, but I didn't, um, um, which basically highlights the different, the different activities that we can do for literacy and mathematics or numeracy outside of school and one of them I just want to highlight again which is math games which is it's so ingrained you know kind of ingrained in our culture is to play games around math and we don't realize that we're actually formalizing those concepts so that was the home part or outside of school part we also talked about teachers mm -hmm. um, I think what, what was really interesting is that this is our third session I think um, talking about mathematics and still new questions came yeah. so um, we started diving into talking about teacher quality and teacher expertise and coaching models and why it's important for teachers to be able to feel supported and also to be able to practice some of these new strategies that um, we are advocating for in the paper. Um, then as that discussion grew, I think Rebecca took us back to the mosaic framework to and also go through the outline of the paper because every 
question that we had, you can go, you can find it, a tile in the mosaic that will give you some some information. So for example, we, we were on three and four, which is the coaching model and the um, effective teachers. And then we also went, as Deepa described, we started talking about the community engagement aspect. And then back to high quality text and materials. Yeah. Um, and I think the discussion could keep going and we keep going back to finding one of these um, one of these tiles to, to give us some more for free thought. Um, another piece um, that did come out also was again just about I think beliefs and attitudes, teachers' beliefs and attitudes, our own beliefs and attitudes to mathematics, the community, and how that is an actual really important part of the work that we do. And I also wanted to highlight the diagram, the Venn diagram that yeah, Rebecca sure. mentioned, and it's like the page is slipping my 24. Or quick letters. So this is another um, on page 24. There, there is a really nice diagram that highlights all of the different areas where math and university uh, reading can intersect and where they are distinct. And the remaining pages of the paper following this diagram. Um, illustrate those more in detail. And one table we didn't talk about, but I'll put in a plug for, uh, is table three. Just to look at the, the detail that is treated there, it's on page 18, and it's under the materials tile, right, the high quality text and materials. But on the left hand side of that table, you have these principles that would apply for high quality materials, both in literacy and in numeracy. But then as the table moves to the right, you have a consideration of both of those disciplines. And sometimes, as for principle one, you see that the considerations for literacy and numeracy are essentially the same, but then sometimes different. So by the time you get down to principle three, you're seeing a very different entry for literacy than what you have for numeracy. So this is a real encapsulation of what our writers were trying to do by saying, there are some important things to always remember, but when you actually watch them play out, sometimes they're the same, and sometimes they differ, depending on which discipline you're highlighting. And just to highlight another, the other table that I had mentioned in the PowerPoint, it's on the... On page four, the different domains you'll see there the literacy domains and the numeracy points. That's also a nice table. Really, all the tables are nice. I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I love this table. <laughs> I'm not sure what mode we're in. Can I bring up something different? Yeah. Okay. Uh, since I look at a lot of stuff, from standpoint of language, one of the things that I wonder if y'all dealt with, I see there's something in the characteristics of quality materials about using language that is corresponds to children's reading level, that kind of thing. It, it seems to me that there may be differences between materials that are written for native speakers and languages and materials written for non-native speakers. My guess is almost invariably Governments are probably oriented towards materials written for native speakers, and they're not not looking at the content, the words, the structures of the thing from the standpoint of language learners. So I don't know if y'all run across that and what and what you looked at that kind of issue. Um, yes, I mean we we did look at that language, and we, if you look at the instructional materials, it says to be very very careful. Uh, not to assume that the language level in mathematics was written with an understanding of what, what the children's actual language learning is. Often you will find that mathematics textbooks are written by mathematicians mm -hmm. who have no understanding of what is the vocabulary level or what type of sentence structure can a child learn in grade two. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah there is a need to ensure that not using language in mathematics that goes beyond what a child could read autonomously in the situation. Knowing that language use in mathematics is complex enough as it is, because sometimes we're using words differently in mathematics than we use them in everyday life. So there is, there's a complexity to mathematical language as it is, 
without adding the fact that we've upped it three reading levels beyond where the child is right now. Um, so we have to be really careful with that. And it, it's not mentioned in the paper, but on the project we worked on in Rwanda, um, that was one of the discussions we did have with the government. Um, with Rwanda Education Board was the use of visuals in textbooks, uh, in mathematics textbooks, and making sure that they're also appropriate because, it, again, it's an adult designing something and they put a visual. I think we're getting used to it now with infographics ourselves, how important having clear information is, but also um, how does that translate into a mathematics textbook for somebody who might be transferring from mother tongue to English, so they might need some more visual, but also what's needed for a, 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 a beginner reader coming into school for the first time, how, how do you place visual and text together to, yeah. to support the learner? Yeah, I second that. I think yeah. that's, that's extremely important because most mathematics textbooks that I've also taken a look at, it's just like straight, you know, like exactly. There are no visuals or diagrams. And even encouraging students to do diagrams is so important because there are different solution pathways. Yeah. And there is also, I think, uh, a need for teachers to understand how to use the visual as well in the classroom and how to use to do proper. Uh, the chalkboard. I mean, we can't forget that the chalkboard is in the classroom, and yet, you know, we say something like fractions are all equal pieces, but then a number line is drawn on the board, or a fraction wall may not necessarily replicate right. the, that fact. Which so. would be part of the technological knowledge discussed on page 24 under the Absolutely. diagram of the interlocking <laughs> circles. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted us to move over to Norma and hear about her group and what they talked about in terms of research. Sure. Um, well, we, we looked at the 10 sort of research topics that, that are presented on page 81. That was the pre tone before it got edited down. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Good to do three. Yes. So we we looked at, at those different topics um, and discussed them and sort of to come to understanding of what they mean. Um, and we had a discussion around some of these aspects, and then we actually did an online poll, which was really cool, uh, to see which ones were the most important. Um, and so number one was, and it surprised us, evidence-based means of increasing teachers mathematical content knowledge, um, both in pre-service and in in-service. So that was the number one. Uh, tied for in second place were teachers' attitudes and beliefs, and the interplay between language and numeracy skills. And then tied in third place were instructional practices that encourage explanation and justification. And, uh, hang on, get my other page. Um, the bottom, which is, uh, teacher's interpretation and application of problem solving. So how do they interpret problem solving? And how do they use problem solving in the classroom? And then uh, towards the end, it was the effective use of technology. Um, so that was the last one. It surprised us because I really thought that the one that people would say is the most important right now as we get started is how do we design really good programs that integrate literacy and numeracy? But we did have one of our on-site people who voted 10 times for that one. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, and then uh, the last that one sort of addresses some of the practicalities of how are we going to design that program, um, knowing that we're probably going to have the same teacher who's going to be the literacy and the numeracy teacher in early primary. So, so how do you make programs that integrate? And then related to that is sort of how do you operationalize this? What do you do with the timetable? Uh -huh. um, what do you do in terms of the amount of time that you have to train this teacher? And how are you going to split that time? And if you split that time into too many pieces, are you going to get anything meaningful from any of the pieces? Um, uh, yeah, your training budget. <laughs> How do you actually do that all across? Um, uh, and what do you do with your curriculum? What if you've got a curriculum that doesn't follow research-based learning sequences or research progressions, or where the pacing is inappropriate? What do you do with that? Um, 
And then, of course, the, the, the uh, whole subject of are scripted lessons going to help us or not? And do we actually need print materials, or can we uh, can we build a really good program where it isn't resource intense? Because we know that with a few basic resources, you can do a lot of really interesting teaching in mathematics. Um, so that's sort of what we what we were focusing on was trying to understand these ones and trying to understand what might be the priority focus for people. So it was rather interesting to see which ones came up as a. This is the number, the number one that we need to actually focus on and figure this out. Well, we're going we're we're going to hit that almost very fast and very furiously, right? Because unless Bethany knows something I don't, no more money is coming. So <laughs> the same money we've struggled to use <laughs> worldwide to do wonderful things in each of these styles for literacy oh, okay. is now going to need to stretch to do wonderful things in two big disciplines, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to very quickly start getting some very concrete answers to, so how do I do that at the curricular level? How do I do that at the teacher training level? How do I do that at the materials level? Uh, so we did have some, we did have uh, some beginnings of an answer. We had uh, Yasmin who was able to join us online and talk a little bit about how they sort of did an integrated approach to literacy and numeracy uh, preschool program in Kenya. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, teacher interest in, in Ghana where we looked at pedagogy and developing content knowledge at the same time by engaging teachers in authentic problem solving. So we, we, we started looking at, you know, do we have some starting points for answers for some of these, but we really have a long ways to go. Right. And I think, as you had said, Mary, the case studies, plug for the case studies yes. that are included, were meant to be a capture of those starting ideas. Yes. All right, yeah, we're going to have Rebecca share with us some of our reflections and moving forward, but I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for this. I think um, after we're done, I think maybe one of the interesting things that comes out of this discussion, I might try to capture and listen back to what Norma just presented, and we can put up maybe a little blog together about the program and share the research questions, because that's definitely something very interesting to share. And of course, as always, our webinars or the online version of this are, are available online. Um, you'll hear about, or at least you'll see a link in the newsletter. So I wanted to thank everybody and um, encourage the others that are here to stay um, because we have some snacks for those we, <laughs> we were able to. We tried to give you a little reward before you go out the door. Um, but I want to have Rebecca come up and share some closing thoughts and um, kind of just maybe some thinking about what we might do next. So thanks, Jennifer. And I, in closing, obviously, great thanks to the authors and then the extended group of colleagues at Jacob Maybach in order to assemble this um, this document. It has a lot of important information and a lot of key nuggets to consider in addressing the big questions that were just raised in the research section. Right? How exactly will we do this? This is the starting point, which is why it's called a working paper. And hopefully how we're going to do it is going to be a very delicate balance between things that we know and are evidence-based and that we learned last time we wrote this merry-go-round with literacy, and then things that we want to try and pilot. And so this working paper attempts to present some things we definitely know from the evidence hence my citation of the long bibliography, <laughs> and then attempts to capture those things that we know for both disciplines, literacy and numeracy, <coughs> while also opening a window onto things we still need to explore and find out. Uh, I think that we're going to be looking from the USAID side very carefully at reasonableness of what we want to try to do in order to avoid those older mistakes I referenced when I opened of just assuming that if we write a, a request for proposal saying teach 50 million children to do 9 million things, somebody will be able to because somebody will not. It was already hard in literacy and if we try to do this comprehensively that will introduce both new opportunities and new complications. So. With this is a great capture of what people at AID understand at the moment about trying to work in this comprehensive way. And I think our joint work together as a community is to start from here and from this working paper and then to continue our lovely road forward to look at the things that we want to explore and research that we have not yet found out. So many thanks to everybody who joined, many thanks to the authors, 
And uh, I'm sure this conversation will be